Good evening or good afternoon to everyone. Thanks so much for joining us at this uh, U.S. Eastern Time afternoon webinar. My name is Jeff Bess and I am Intuit Labs Chief Marketing Officer and also a part-time evangelist because I love what I sell and hopefully I can um, impart some of that enthusiasm to each of you throughout this webinar. Uh, there are two reasons we have a webinar. You know the word intuitive is in the name of the product so why do we have a webinar about something that's so intuitive? Well there, there are two reasons. One, there's a uh, not often, but there can be a misconception that, well, I guess this is PowerPoint with multi-touch. It's a slideware program that you can touch. We are so much more than that that we need at least one hour to tell you all of the different ways <laughs> this is more than interactive bullet points on a slide. Uh, and uh, I think I'll be able to prove that point to you fairly conclusively. The, the other reason is because, okay, maybe you don't think it's PowerPoint with multi-touch, but it's probably hard. You need to be a developer, highly technical, and that is also patently untrue. In fact, we say if you can use PowerPoint, you can use Intuiface. That's the hurdle, and that's not uh, meant to be an insult to PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a great product, and it's very usable. I think the same thing goes for Intuiface. This is not a hard product to use at all. You'll be amazed at what you can create with a little bit of effort using our software. So hopefully, again, by the end of this webinar, I will dispel those two possible misconceptions you have. Uh, we'll begin by just discussing briefly what one can build with into a face. If it's not just bullet points on a slide, what can you build? We'll briefly review the differences between composer and player, the two licensable components of the Intuit face platform. We'll then spend a large amount of time, the bulk of our time, discussing the design philosophies and concepts behind the creation of interactive experiences and then wrap things up talking about what do you do with your great work once you're done. How do you share it, how do you deploy it, that sort of thing. This experience will be shared with you at the conclusion of the webinar. You'll be able to take it in-house, take a look at it, see how we built it, etc. On this space, the next space after the agenda slide is a video. I'm not going to play it here, it's still a screen share, it may not be the best performance, but certainly I encourage you to play it when you get your hands on this experience. It's a medley uh, videos illustrating what customers have achieved using Intuiface. I think you'll be surprised at what's possible if you haven't seen this video already. Uh, it's a huge variety for a, a significant number of use cases uh, and no two look alike, which I think is a very important point. Th this is not a buy a template, add your content kind of product. It is completely free form. Uh, the only thing these experiences you see on your screen have in common is they're all landscape which, by the way, isn't a restriction either. You can build experiences that require a portrait orientation. You can build experiences that are displayed on a multi-screen display wall, a three-by-three three display wall. You can construct an experience for any dimension. Uh, the visuals itself, the aesthetics themselves, completely different. You control every pixel of the experience. There are no template restrictions whatsoever. You could build your own if you want. That could certainly accelerate some of your own work. Maybe your design agency, you're selling a standard package that is based on some in-house created templates. Great, do it. But out of the box, there are absolutely no restrictions. You control every pixel. You can capture any design you wish. There are two licensable components of the Intuiface platform, Composer and Player. Composer is the tool you use to create your interactive experiences. Player is the software product you use to run your interactive experiences. It is certainly possible that you possess a small number of composers and a very large number of players. We have customers who own one license of composer, two license of composers, but have a hundred device deployment. There is no limit to the number of experiences you can create with composer. There is no limit to the number of experiences you can run with player, one at a time. So the ratio has no dependency on what you're trying to build or how many things you're trying to build. It's just about the number of machines. Composer runs on Windows, period, end of story. It runs on Windows. If you want to use a Mac, go ahead, but then you need something like Boot Camp or Parallels as a virtual machine. Player runs on Windows, iPad, and Android. So in fact, we support three different operating systems for player, Windows for Composer, so just keep that in mind. This entire webinar will be spent in Composer. 
player is just the runtime. Its job is simply to run the thing you build in Composer. There's nothing to show you. It just runs stuff. So the entire webinar will be focused on Composer. There are three editions of Composer. You might have seen this if you saw our pricing page. You're not meant to be an expert by the end of this webinar. I just want to make the point that everything we discuss, with a couple of exceptions that I will call out, everything we discuss you can do with the free edition. The free edition is free forever. It doesn't stop working after a set period of time. And from a design perspective, is feature equivalent at 99% of uh, pro and enterprise. There are differences, and I'll point it out when we get there. But by and large, the vast majority of what we discussed in this webinar, you can do with your free edition. So I'm not trying to game the system based on the demonstrations in this discussion. There. Now you have a general sense of what you can build with Intuaface. We'll clarify that throughout the webinar. You understand the differences between composer and player. I'm ready to get started <laughs> on design philosophy and concepts. Let me just ask Seb if there's any opening questions before we get started. Um, actually, I, yeah, I got just one question which was about the platform. So for the moment, the player is running either Windows, and Android, on an iPad, and very soon a new platform from Samsung. We talk about that uh, at IEC in Amsterdam in uh, three weeks from now. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thanks, Sip. Okay. You are now looking at Composer. This is the editor. This is the product you use to create your interactive experiences. You will spend all your time inside Composer. Again, player is just the runtime. First thing we need to focus on to get a lay of the land is the notion of a space. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner there's a panel called the Spaces panel. It has a list of spaces. You can think of these as slides. We call them spaces. One of the biggest differences between a slide and our space is that the order of spaces doesn't typically have any relevance to the order of the experience encountered by your end user. The path followed by one of your end users through an, an Intuaface experience might be all over the place. It's based on what they decide to do. It could be from space 1 to space 12 to space 4 to space 50. It could be all over the place. Unlike with slides, which are typically sequential on purpose, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Spaces don't have to be that way. Uh, it is obviously helpful from a design perspective to organize your spaces appropriately. This is where you're doing your work. You want to make sure you name them properly and order them in a way that makes sense to you. But from the end user's perspective, okay, it doesn't have to be very relevant. Uh, you can group spaces by what we call sequences. You'll notice we have this notion of philosophy and concepts. It has a lot of child spaces. Uh, that's what we call the sequence. Again, you don't have to use it, but it's nice to organize your work by sequence. You can group things logically at the design time. The center space is referred to as the scene. Whichever space is selected in the spaces panel, the content of that space is, is available in the scene. The scene is where you do all your actual work. This is where you add your content and organize it and do all the other funky stuff we'll talk about in this webinar. Uh, the bottom left corner of Composer has the space content panel. This is a summary of all the stuff in the scene. So for example, this Intuaface logo is actually this guy up here in the scene. If I click the title in the scene, it's actually this text asset here in the space content panel. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between everything in the scene and the items in the space content panel. And depending on what you're doing, you might use one versus the other. Uh, typically, you can do just about everything from the scene itself. You'll note that in the space content panel, there's a reference to layers. Here it says back, middle, and front. This is about depth, which is very important for an interactive experience where people are expected to be touching things, uh, interacting with them. You need to know that depth in and out of the screen, uh, sometimes referred to as the Z order. Right? You have X and Y on the screen, the, the, the flat plane, and then the Z order is coming in and out of the screen. That depth is very important to have intuitive and sensible uh, designs. We have three major layers, back, middle, and front. And in fact, when you add multiple items to a given layer, they're also stacked. There's a notion of Z order as well. So there's depth everywhere, but it's an important concept that uh, you'll slowly become accustomed to as you uh, develop your interface experience creation skills. Okay. So you know, we have multiple spaces in this experience, uh, and um, this is where you do all your work. 
So next, assets and collections. Assets, that's the content you're going to work with, assets. When you add an image, what you're really adding is an image asset, which is a container that references an image. When you add a video, you're adding a video asset. It's a container that references a video. There are multiple asset types, uh, image, video, webcam. You can have a live feed off a webcam. It takes snapshots. Documents, uh, you can import PDF, uh, Excel, PowerPoint. Web browser, you can have a live web browser, your live connection to the Internet. You can browse the web through our product. Two text assets. Flash, you can embed Flash. 3D models, we support XAML today. That's the 3D model format we support today. With the next release in February, we're extending that list significantly to uh, add other 3D model formats. Audio and Deep Zoom, Microsoft Deep Zoom. These are all the asset types we support. Let's start with an image. Let's talk about a very classic standard kind of asset. Here is Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Great movie. It's a JPEG. I just dragged it into the scene. And it is added to this what you see, what you get editor, so I can move it around and rotate it and do all the stuff you'd expect to be able to do in this kind of editor. Let me press, press play. In play mode, I'm working on a laptop with a touch screen, so I can touch my screen. This image is automatically interactive. I don't have to ask it to be interactive. I don't have to beg it to be interactive. It's just interactive. I can pan, zoom, etc. You'll note that this image in the properties panel, it's actually a container that references a very specific image. I can change that image. I can say, no, 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 I don't want it to be that image. I want it to be something else. This becomes important later on because the idea is you can change that on the fly. One of the really cool aspects of IntuaFace is you do not have to use what was created at, at design time. You can create an experience that will change at runtime. And one of the reasons you can do that is because an asset is really a container referencing content. So you can change the content, and you can do that on the fly. Uh, one other cool aspect of uh, the, the scene is that you can change the background image. So not only can you have an image in the foreground added into one of the layers, you can actually change the background image. If I drag in this particular image right here, this is in fact a full HD image. It's, a, it's formatted for a 1920 by 1080 display which is the format of the experience we're working in for this webinar. I just have to right click this, say set as background, and it replaces the existing background with that image. This is important because you notice in the space content panel, it's not in a layer. It's an independent property that enables me to, again, control every single pixel so that no aspect of this experience needs to look like any other. By the way, not only can I have an image as a background, I can make it a, pic a color or even a video. So I can have a video running in the background in a loop. All the other content, all the other design occurs in front of it. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a PNG file. We do support other formats like JPEG. You can even import from Photoshop. So one of the nice features in PowerPoint and in, in IntuaFace is the ability to drag and drop PSD files into IntuaFace and it automatically converts the content of that file into images. It could be each layer becomes its own image, it could be a single image that's comprised of multiple layers, that's configurable. But the beauty is you can work with a design team, maybe you're a designer, rather than having to export your content to a, a static uh, image format, just drag the PSD file in directly. So here we have a single image. I can drag in other images, so here's other movie posters from the Tim Burton canon, drag them into my space. And here we've essentially created an image wall with about two seconds worth of work. So now you're an image wall expert, you can install it to a face and build an image wall for your trade show. Pushing play, now instead of having one interactive image, the, the uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, now I have multiple. So I can move them all around, I don't know how well you can see this, I'm moving multiple images at the same time. We are not constrained, and Tuaface is not constrained in terms of the number of touch points. If your hardware permits, permits 60 touch points, 64 touch points, then go ahead with your Tuaface experience, work with 64 touch points. My laptop is a 15 inch display. It's probably a one person kind of interaction. I'm not really going to have 10 fingers on the display at the same time. If I have an 82 inch perceptive pixel display, it's still 1920 by 1080. 
it's the same number of pixels, they're just bigger pixels, it's an 82 inch display, well yeah, I might actually have multiple people working on that, we're perfectly fine. So if you anticipate your deployment might be for a multi-screen display wall or just a very large display, it is perfectly acceptable to build a design intended to be used by more than one person at the same time. Go ahead. So let's move over these images to make room for a couple more asset types. Here we have a PDF file, so now I'm adding a document to my experience, and we have, here we go, we have a video. So now we've added a video and a book. Uh, the video is, here it is, okay, and let's push play. Just to bring home once again, you can have multiple asset types in the same space. It's not as if you can only have images, it's not as if you can only have documents. So this video is playing, and I'm now turning, I'm sliding through the book, and I'm moving images, and the video is playing, and I'm using a webinar software, so a lot of multitasking going on. Build any design you want, comprise of any con content you wish. Hope that makes sense, because now we're going to transition from assets to collections. As you've seen, assets are the images, the videos, the documents. When I add content to my experience, they show up here in the content library. So that panel called the content library, its job is to hold all of the images and videos and documents that I've added to my experience. So you can see down here at the bottom, here's all the posters that I've added, etc. The content library is global to my experience, unlike the space content panel on the lower left. This is specific to the scene, to the space that I'm currently editing. The content library is global because I might use the same content on multiple spaces. And you can filter and you can sort it. Well, this is where you can find your content. This is all the content used in your assets. Assets are great. They're important. There's another concept, however, called a collection, which allows me to interact not with just one asset at a time, but multiple. I've, I've selected all of these images collectively, right-clicked, and I'm choosing the item add into group. And now these items have been added into a group. You can see that I can move them around as if they were just one item. If I double-click, okay, I can arrange these. You notice, see that? I can arrange these. Yeah, the group is, is a bit like a group in PowerPoint. It's very reminiscent of that. Uh, in Intuaface, you might use it to create a data sheet where there's text assets and videos and documents, and they need to have very specific... Uh, positional relationships with each other, but maybe it's resizable, you want to move it around the page, that's where a group comes in. There are probably collection types they'll use more often up front. The group is great, but up front I suspect there are other collection types they'll use first. For example, I'm going to, in the properties panel down here, which we'll spend more time in in a moment, I will change this group to an asset grid. The asset grid is another collection type. This is really a display type explicitly so I can browse a variety of media. Here I have five images. These are the properties panel. Let's make them a bit bigger, like so. Okay, so here is my asset grid. It is a single interactive context enabling me to browse assets, collections, a mixture of the both. I can have collections inside collections. I can have uh, images, videos, documents inside collections, there's no limit. Using my finger, I'm swiping to the left and I'm swiping to the right. You see that? Asset grids are comprised of rows and columns. I might have 50 images and I can browse through the rows and columns to, identify, to, to find the item that I'm looking for. So it's a nice way to display a whole bunch of content collectively. There's a lot more you can do and we'll get there in a moment, but right now it's a way to display a whole bunch of content collectively. There are multiple collection types. You saw the group previously. This is the asset grid, rows and columns. There are others. There is the asset flow. This is like the, the album flow, the cover flow you might find it in iTunes, right, where the center item is in focus. It's right up front, and then uh, both left and right, it fades off into the distance. Carousel. This is a nice one. This, this one is an often a good way to show content. It's a carousel. Let me play with the properties down below. Let's decrease the viewing angle and increase the size of these guys a little bit so it's easier to see, and maybe it's a little, there you go. So here's my carousel, and I can spin that around to view my, my content. Circular panel, it's another collection type. This is a circle. 
Uh, but think of it as an unlimited circle. So there's a beginning and end point of the circle. So if more than you have more items that fit in the circle, you can still browse all of them. Flip chart, one at a time. And you can use your fingers to flip through the flip chart. Uh, group we've discussed, helix. Think of this as a strand of DNA. And it's like a carousel in that it's endless. Once you reach the first, the last item, it goes back to the first item. But it spirals uh, in both directions to infinity. And it's a really neat effect. The map, we'll talk about that in a moment. It's too cool to skip over, so we'll talk about that in a moment in more detail. Pinboard. Think of a pinboard as a space in a space. Groups, the positional orientation of each item is very specific and very important. In a pinboard, you're meant to interact with the stuff inside it. So you can nest spaces and you can get really funky with that. Slideshow. That's a collection similar to the Ken Burns effect. Slow pan, slow zoom, transition to new image. Slow pan, slow zoom, transition to new image. It's more of a visual effect. You're not really meant to interact with it. You might have it as an attract loop on a, on a home space, something to that effect. It's a really neat thing to look at. And then timeline. Timeline is very similar to the map. So we'll talk about them collectively. Okay? So all of these collections exist to enable me to display multiple assets or other collections or a combination of the two at the same time. The map is too cool. So let's talk about the map specifically. So let's hide, get rid of this collection. In this quick access toolbar to the left, here are all the asset types here up top, and I can expand this to get to more asset types. Way down here, there's my map. So let's add the map collection to my space. We support two uh, map providers. One is Bing Maps, the other is OpenStreetMaps. OpenStreetMaps is free by definition, it just works. Bing Maps works. But Microsoft requires that all users get their own API key. Uh, I don't believe there's a cost associated with it, but we can't give you the key. You have to get one of your own, and we document online how to do that. But don't blame us, that's, that's Microsoft. We default to OpenStreetMaps, and as I said, this is a live feed. So if I double-click inside this map and use my mouse, I am, I am browsing this live OpenStreetMap. Let's zoom in on where I am sitting right now which is north of Boston on this little finger of land called Cape Ann. Right above Gloucester, I can see the ocean from my window. Rockport, Massachusetts, so that's where I am. Okay, nice. It's an interactive map, kind of cool, you can browse it. Why do we call this a collection? Good question. Because I can add items to it like any other collection. I have added this image to my collection. You'll notice in the, in the space content panel, it's a child of the map. Like any collection, I can add items to that collection, and they become children. I can place this wherever I wish, and it's an image. I can resize it if I want. Notice in the properties panel, there are two properties called latitude and longitude. Items added to the map collection inherit a latitude longitude coordinate. And I can move them wherever I wish, and that property updates on the fly. They become points of interest. Whether I add an image, a video, a document, another collection, no matter what I add to the map collection, inherits a latitude longitude coordinate. And as a point of, in, of, uh, of interest, that means that if I move the map, the points of interest move with it. Now that's beautiful because that means you can indicate, I don't know, all your retail locations with maybe a video. So each retail location has its own video that you can play. Uh, or its own PDF that you can open or what have you. You can even, and we haven't talked about buttons and triggers and actions, but you can even use this as a table of contents, as a way to enable navigation to other information. I could put buttons in my map, treat them as points of interest, but when you touch the button, it causes something completely different to happen, such as navigating to a new space, playing a video, opening another map, who knows? Okay? That's the beauty of the map collection. The timeline collection is like the map, but instead of latitude, longitude, it's dates. I can add images, videos, documents, 3D models, other collections to my timeline. Each item added has its own date, and I can swipe my way through history and zoom in and zoom out of years. Maybe it's the history of my company or who knows what. So that's the great thing about the map collection, the timeline collection, is you can assign items to very specific points of interest 
and use that either just to share information or as a navigational aid to navigate people to other stuff. So very cool. Seb, before I transition to a deeper properties discussion, any questions right now? Yes, actually I had a few questions about adding uh, multiple assets in the carousel. How many assets can you put in the carousel? Um, I answered most of them in the chat room. Uh, but to summarize this, uh, so on the right side of Composer, you have the content library, which will gather all the content you have in your experience. Every single image of this content library can be used once or several times uh, in the experience, in one collection, in several collections, collections can be in different spaces where you have only one image um, stored in the content library. This is the example with the interface logo that you have on the top right corner of this space. Um, regarding number of assets, we don't have any limit technically uh, in the collections, although if we take the example of the carousel, if you put four images you get a square, if you put a hundred images you get a very huge wheel that you have to rotate. So you would have to adjust the diameter of the carousel so it looks nice. If you don't know in advance how many items you're going to have in your collection, which we will see later with the interface assets and the XML feeds or Excel feeds, um, you can use the asset flow uh, which, to, which will adapt to the number of assets that you have. Um, so yes, the, the second question was about uh, can the content be generated dynamically by XML and yes, we will see that in section number six later in the webinar. Thank you, Seb. Let's now talk about properties. We'll return to, actually we have it in the content library, so let's just add it from the content library. We have our PDF document added to this property space. We had already added a variety of Tim Burton movie posters. I'll select a bunch, drag it into my scene. Here, I'm choosing the option create a collection. Certain space means please make that image wall. Create a collection. We default to the asset grid. So here we go. Here's the asset grid. Shrink that a little bit. Properties. You've noticed I've manipulated properties in the properties panel on the bottom left here of Composer. There's also a button for uh, all properties. There's a whole bunch. Let's, let's play with this a little bit. You might recall that when I pushed play mode earlier and interacted with this document, it was a scroll. It scrolled left and right, which is nice, and that might be suitable for your design, but I guess a more traditional approach would be a book format. One of the many properties of the document asset is the ability to change its style. Uh, that property is, in fact, available through the, the basic properties panel here. I can just select that button, and rather than horizontal scroll, choose book. And you'll note it goes, oh, okay, so this has a cover and it's got pages, and great. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, the collection. So there's a ton of properties here. Again, you saw me manipulate some of them. I can change the item width and height just directly in the properties panel, maybe reduce the spacing a little bit. But in the all properties panel, there's a ton of properties I can use to modify how it looks, how it reacts to user input, that sort of thing. There is no time to go through all of these properties. So, for example, these arrows. Yeah, I don't want those arrows. Okay, see show controls? Click. Now you don't have the arrows anymore. It's very configurable. It doesn't have to look the way you see it by default. Two particular properties. They're just so interesting. Let's talk about them in this webinar. Tap item to open. Click. Drag and drop item to open. Click. To date, we've talked about content inside a collection and it stayed inside that collection. If I had a video inside a collection, I could play that video inside the collection. And if I had a carousel of six videos, I could swipe to the video I want, push play on that video, and it's playing inside the collection. Alternatively, maybe I want to pop out a copy. I don't want it to be inside the collection. I want to pop it out. Okay, play. So two mouse clicks. I guess three if you consider opening the properties panel. We'll start with the book. I'm using my finger in the upper right corner, and we're turning the page. See that? a nice little effect. And of course, I can make this as big as I want and then turn the pages, right? So there's, I, I don't lose the ability to interact with it if I have the page turn effect. Then we have the asset grid. Uh, I like the movie Beetlejuice, one, two, three, touch. There's the image that popped out. Why? Because I selected the item, tap item to open. 
slide to the left. Here's Batman Forever. I'm going to one, two, three, drag and drop. And now I have a copy. So there are two methods supporting the ability to create copies. If that was a video, I create a copy of the video that I could play. If that was a map, I create a copy of the map that I can interact with. So there are anything you have inside the collection, you can create a copy of that and make it interactive. This is eye candy, right? I mean, imagine what you can already build with the little bit you now know about Interface to create a much more engaging sales pitch, trade show presentation, information kiosk, what have you. As I mentioned, there's a ton of properties. Here's a couple others that are just so neat. It's great to talk about it now. Uh, one is visual effects. So here's the book. We'll open the properties panel, visibility and effects. I can change the opacity. Watch as I drop the opacity, the document slowly fades away or comes back. Blur, grayscale, sepia. So a lot of the kind of things one would expect to be able to do in, I don't know, a Photoshop, After Effects, you can actually do in the product. To anything, collection, image, video, map, doesn't matter, all these product uh, capabilities exist. Another frequently requested capability, we're always asked, is the ability to draw on the screen. I want to annotate an image. How do I annotate an image? Watch how easy this is. I'm selecting the images in my collection. Notice I'm in the space content panel. I'm just selecting the images in that collection. Clicking the show all properties button. Show me all the properties that these images have in common. Here's tools. Show drawing tools which defaults to a blue, a gray, and a green line. Let's turn the gray to a red line so it's easy to see. One more pen width. There we go. OK. What I have done is I have said, please, for each one of these images, add drawing capabilities so I can annotate it. I don't know, two or three mouse clicks. We're back to this experience. Here's my book with the pages. Here's my asset grid that I, can navigate, that I can interact with. One, two, three, touch James and the giant peach. Here's an image. And notice there's a little button on the left now, which is the drawing tool. Big pen width, red ink, draw it on the image. This is a peach. This guy's name is James, right? I can annotate this image, and by the way, it sticks to it, it stays there, and I can save this to a file, send it as an email attachment. I don't have to lose this annotation. So with just two clicks of the mouse, turn on the drawing tools, click OK. We have it. You can do this for images, you can do this for the entire space. You can mark up everything. Just by adding the drawing tools, you're two properties away. Now you have a basic understanding of properties. So let's move on to one of the greatest aspects of Intuiface, which is triggers and actions. This is the if this happens, then do that paradigm of Intuiface. Buttons are the classic way to understand the notion of triggers and actions. If this button is pressed, then do something. In fact, there are over 200 triggers in Intuiface. There are over 200 actions. You have tons to choose from. Some are universal, like tap. Pretty much everything in Intuiface has an associated tap trigger. So if you tap it, you can make something happen. Same thing for actions, like hide. You can hide anything. So everything has a hide action. Other triggers and actions are, are very specific to a, a type of asset. For, for the video, um, if played, then. OK, well, that doesn't mean anything for an image. If played is very specific to a video. Or when timestamp reach. Right? That's a trigger for a video. Or go to timestamp. That would be an action for a video. It's kind of unique to a video. So some are unique, some are universal. Either way, it's crazy powerful because it's enabling you to make your experience very customizably reactive to your user. There's an infinite number of paths and things you can cause to occur in response to either user interaction or even the environment. The button, and you can see it here in the quick access panel, here's the button, so I'm adding one button to my space. The button is the classic example of a trigger source. We all get that. 
In Intuaface, there are two kinds of buttons, a simple button and an image button. We always default to the simple, so you can modify the color. So here, let's make it a little green, and the outline color is red, and I can, okay, and you can say push me, right? Oh, and uh, let's make the font black so it's easier to read. There's a button, and it kind of looks like a button. You can round the edges, you can do other things. We do also have an image button which looks like an image. It doesn't look like a button. So in fact, any visual could act like a button even though it doesn't look like it. Even better, by the way, in fact, if I change this to an image button on the fly, you'll note in the properties panel it says released image and pressed image. I can specify both what the button should look like when it's touched and what the button should look like when it's not touched. That gives that visual feedback when it's pressed. It's pretty flexible. Here we'll just use the simple button. Now you may have noticed there's a little problem. The button doesn't do anything yet. We've added a button, but what's supposed to happen when you touch it? This is an excuse for going to this final panel in the bottom right, the Triggers and Actions panel. This is where we specify the exact trigger and the actions we want to happen. I will click Add a Trigger, and it says, okay, you have the button selected, so when the button called Push Me is pressed and released, then do something. I'm not sure you know how awesome this is, by the way, because this is programming without writing any code. This is programming. When the button is pressed and released, I notice we could have said pressed, but we default to released. And the reason is this allows people to change their mind. They can touch the button, drag the finger off, and Intuiface says, okay, I'll ignore that. Just like if you click a link in a web browser, but drag your mouse off before you let go of the mouse button, it knows to ignore the request. So we default to is released. When that button is pressed and released, then what? And here we'll say space to space navigation, go to the space named properties. This is how you do navigation in a tool face, through triggers and actions. Anything could be a trigger. Here it's the button. I'm pushing play. Here we have the button push me, one, two, three, touch, and we navigate to the property space. Simple. Doesn't have to even be an asset, just as another example of how ubiquitous, how triggers are everywhere. If I put my finger in an empty part of the space and drag it to the left, it takes me back to the triggers and action space. Why? Because even on-screen gestures can be triggers. Let's take a look. In and to a face, on, on every space, if you look for the space itself, notice in the space content panel, we're on the space itself, we're not looking at any particular item, on top of it, the space itself, there are two triggers. Detect a gesture, swipe left, detect a gesture, swipe right. Which cause navigation actions, go to the next space, go to the previous space. In fact, next and previous are about the order of the spaces and the spaces panel. So it's one of those rare instances where the order does matter. But I could have said forward and backward, which is like a website. So it doesn't matter where you came from, just go back to that. It doesn't have to be the order. But here we went by the order. So you'll note that Triggers can be caused by user interaction. Maybe I'm pushing a button, playing a video, swiping the screen. It can also be environmental. And a good example of an environmental trigger is a timer. Let's add a trigger. Again, I've selected the background. That means I'm selecting the space overall, not a particular item in that space, and then adding a trigger. Timers, an inactivity timer for three seconds. When this space has been inactive for three seconds, then let's navigate back to the property space. Why would I use an inactivity timer? Because I don't want my kiosk in a public place to be stuck on some random space that doesn't attract attention. I want to make sure that after X number of seconds, X number of minutes, it's smart enough to automatically go back to the attract loop to generate more interest. Push and play. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, go. Three seconds isn't a very long time. If you have a video on your space, you probably want the timer to be at least longer than the video. So there, there are ways to configure this. But at the end of the day, you can react to the environment as well. And it doesn't just have to be timers. There's, there's a significant number of things you can do through 
interface assets that we'll get into, or just about anything on the planet can be a trigger. <laughs> There's one really cool action that I have to talk about. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it at a high level because it gets kind of involved. Um, animation is an action. Okay. Any property that has a range of values can be animated by Intuiface because you can move it through that range of values. And since I can have multiple actions for one trigger, I can animate multiple things as the result of a single, a single trigger and choreograph those things, like in a PowerPoint. So I can cause things to hide and to show and to move around the screen and resize and uh, tons of things. Just through actions. That's how powerful actions are. In fact, I'll show you an example of animation when we talk about design accelerators. Seven, any questions before we go on? Yes, actually uh, I had two questions which cover the same topic. Can we program our own trigger or can we actually add our own code to make it more complicated and use stuff like if, while, for? If yes, in what language is it? So the first thing is we try to keep interface very simple to use and for non-developers. So my first answer would be no, you cannot program your own trigger, you cannot add some logic internally within interface like if, while, for. Um, because you can program basically in the interface. Well, this isn't really true uh, because as you, you cannot add new triggers on existing assets like an image, like a video, for example. But if you want to add some triggers from some external logic, from business rules, from a peripheral, you can use the interface assets that we will see in section six uh, a little bit later in the webinar. And there we, you can use .NET, JavaScript, or REST web services to add this kind of logic inside your experience. Uh, just another point about that. In the next major version that we are going to release in February, we will add some converters um, which uh, will go with the bindings we are going to see in the next section. Um, those converters we will have some built-in converters provided with the, the official release of the interface. You will be able to create your own using the same languages I mentioned, so .NET, JavaScript, web services. And you may have a special one in which you can directly type some script inside Composer using JavaScript to be announced in February. That's it for the questions. Thanks, Seb. Yeah, we'll talk about how to extend into a phase to incorporate external logic or data in uh, chapter six here. So we will revisit that topic, don't worry about it. Design Accelerators allows me to talk about the very last panel in Composer. You can see it in the upper right. These are pre-built assets, content, spaces, pretty much anything you can think of. Things we've built to help you accelerate your creation of aesthetically pleasing, engaging, interactive experiences. Out of the box, there's a small subset. This is all of them because I've downloaded all of them. In fact, when you first install Composer, you'll see a short list. Click this Get More Accelerators button to access a panel that lets you download more stuff. It could be background images. You want to have a nice custom background, but you don't have anything in mind. We pre-built some images for you that you can use. Uh, same thing goes for background videos a whole bunch of buttons that we've built for you that you might want to incorporate so you don't have to design them yourself. Uh, you can draw basic shapes, uh, circles, rectangles, etc. A whole bunch of animated menus, uh, clocks, uh, pre-built spaces for like a scratch card, sound effects, tons of stuff. Uh, to, to illustrate animation, let me add this design accelerator. This is a finger showing a touch. Of course, if you're, particularly if you're building something for public space, but it really doesn't matter if, if at any point in time somebody will use your experience without a host, meaning they'll have to teach themselves. You probably need some kind of directions, and the wordier it is, the worse it's going to be, right? So it's ideal that you have something that is simply as possible, hopefully graphically indicating what you're supposed to do. Well, that kind of looks like a finger that's touching the screen, right? I mean, it, it does. But if I push play, you'll notice 
that it's preloaded with animation. You'll see that the hand essentially gets bigger and smaller, and when it looks like the hand is down, that circle appears as if it was a touch. I would say fairly universally at this point, if you put this somewhere, people would understand I'm supposed to touch. They would get it's a tap, right? This animation triggers an actions. Okay? We're, we, we're using actions to change the size of that circle, to change the size of the hand, and choreograph it so when the hand goes quote unquote down, the circle appears, you get the idea. And you can do some pretty amazing things. I've, I've, I've always said this, between triggers and actions and uh, animation and uh, what we're about to discuss, in interface assets and binding, I see things I have no idea how they built it. <laughs> I don't recognize our own software in the field, which I think is a good thing. Under the covers, very simple building blocks. Very simple building blocks. So that's design accelerators. If you have Composer Enterprise, so feature alert, so here's one of those rare exceptions. If you have Composer Enterprise, you can create your own design accelerators. So, so you can use them across multiple projects. Composer Free, Composer Pro, be our guest. Use the pre-built accelerators we've created. You can see there's a ton. Composer Enterprise, you can build your own and use them across projects. Okay, last big topic. A great topic. A topic so awesome it really needs its own webinar at some point because it's so powerful. The idea is that let's talk about interface assets first. Thanks to interface assets, you can access external data, business logic, and devices that are not supported out of the box. You have a database, you want to write information to the database, just create an interface. Uh, you have some business logic, like a search function. You want to search a database. Somebody enters information through the interface-based interface. You want to take that information, search a database, return some other information. Great. Create an interface to the search function. You have another device, RFID, NFC reader, um, some gesture control device. Doesn't matter. Does it have an API? Great. Write an interface. So the beauty of interface is you are not locked into creating static experiences or only to the devices and the business logic that we support. You can interface with anything you want to the notion of an interface. And yes, somebody has to create that interface. You're essentially teaching Composer how to talk to that thing that's out there. That interface has to be written by somebody that understands some very basic development capabilities, have very basic development skills, but they'd have to have it. Or we can help you do it. But. but in the product, there's no coding. You never see that in the product. In the product, it's just a thing. So for example, if I open this panel, the very last button on the bottom left, these are all of the out-of-the-box interface assets we ship with Intuiface. We built, just like design accelerators, we pre-built all these things. Whether you have the free edition Pro or Enterprise, you can use all of them. To illustrate what I mean by interfacing with something offline, let's look at weather. We'll talk about the others in a moment, but here's weather. There's a REST-based web service that's freely accessible and enables you to get the weather about a given city and get a forecast. This visualization of that data that you see here, you can completely blow that up. You don't have to use that. We just pre-built it so you have something in order to get an understanding of what data is available. But you can completely redesign this thing. It doesn't have to look anything like this. It's just something we pre-built. This interface allows me to modify the number of days. There's a hidden API key that you're allowed to use, and the location. If I change London to Boston, now I'm getting, it's a live feed, it's a real rest, it's not on my PC, it's in the cloud somewhere. Here's the weather for Boston. Interface assets enable me to go off the device, typically. It doesn't have to be, it could be peripheral, but you get the idea. It goes out of the experience to get information, to push information, to work with the device, that sort of thing. And it's very flexible. Let's take a look at the list of pre-built interfaces. I can work with Excel, read from it, write to it. Analytics. This is a huge topic because it allows you to capture user decisions and store them offline for analysis. Which were the most visited spaces? What was the most popular products? Uh, which videos are played more than any others. You can record all of this information and have it stored in a log in the cloud that we provide. If you have a thousand devices, 
They're all recording this usage information. They're all pumping it into this cloud-based repository that we provide. And then you can download it for offline analysis. How great is that? And we implement it through an interface. Chronometer, clock, count time, countdown. There's logic here, right? There's no clock inside the product per se. What we've done is we've pre-built a simple little clock and an interface to that logic so you can have a clock in your experience or a timer or a scheduler. This is the schedule changes. At 3 o'clock on Tuesday, I want this to happen. At 5 o'clock on Wednesday, I want this to happen. It's just an interface that we've created called the scheduler. Uh, global variables, uh, number converters, random uh, number generators, save to the file system, share via email, uh, live Flickr search, blog feeds, tweet lists, uh, conversion of addresses into coordinates and vice versa with geocoding, our, our ability to work with connect and remote gestures, interfaces, we pre-built these for you so we can communicate with connect, see what gestures were performed and associate them with actions inside the product. Our leap motion support is achieved the same way. Philips Hue, out of the box, turn it on, turn it off, change the color, make it flash. All of this is enabled because the Philips Hue has an API, and it's on the web, so you can talk to it. So in fact, the whole Internet of Things is available to you through interfaces. Turn on your car, <laughs> right? You know, program your DVR. I mean, anything with an API, you can communi communicate with through into a face, thanks to interfaces. How good is that? So if you want to create your own interface, it could be JavaScript, it could be a .NET DLL, it could be a REST-based web service. This is the sort of the interface requires that you're communicating either with a .NET DLL, some JavaScript function, or a REST-based web service, which pretty much covers all the bases. But you know, that, that's what you have to choose from. OK, so now you have a general understanding of, of interfaces and why they're powerful. What the heck is binding? Well, Binding is a key ingredient of interfaces. You can't really work with interfaces if you don't have binding. Binding is the process of assigning the value of one thing to another thing. You're binding the target to the source. If the value is in some web service in the cloud, how do you get that value into the text asset in your interface experience? Through binding. You bind the text asset to the service. Let me give you an easier example. See this logo in the upper right? It's been on every space. Every space has this logo. If I select it, you'll notice that its XY value is orange. That means that the value for X and the value of Y is not coming here. It's not assigned here. It's coming from some resource. It's bound to a resource. Clicking the orange items opens up the properties panel and shows me where the values are coming from. This drop-down list is telling me it's coming from the logo on the introduction space. It's from a completely different space, in my experience, is a logo. And we are essentially taking the x and y value from that space and pumping it into the logo here. This logo is x and y values are bound to the x and y values of the logo on the introduction space. Let's prove it. Here's the introduction space way at the beginning. Here's my logo. Move it down. We'll go back to the introduction space, uh, to the interface asset space. And here's my logo. Why is it down there? Because it's bound. So whatever happens on that first space is going to affect what happens here. You'd be amazed at what you can do with binding because, in fact, you don't even have to bind similar properties. You can end up with really funky effects. Certainly, binding is helpful both at design time and at runtime. At design time, this enables me to always reposition my logo. I just have to go to the int introduction space, reposition my logo, and all the other spaces update at the same time, at design time. At runtime, well, sky's the limit through interface assets. You'd be amazed. Let's move this out of the way so it's not in the way when we conclude our conversation. So that's interface assets and binding. It's a whole world of opportunity. Seb, any questions? Yes, a few of them. Uh, so let me go back in the questions. Um, 
So do we have access to the analytics data for free? Uh, you have access to the feature, so you can test it with the free version. You can send analytics from composer or player and retrieve them uh, from your management console. I think Jeff will talk about this at the end of the webinar quickly. Uh, the free limitation is that you get only the 10 latest logs or 20 latest logs, something like that. Um, which answers another question, any statistics module that can output all the click visits. So yes, this is what we call the analytics. Uh, I gave the, the URL of the documentation in the chat. Um, another question regarding virtual keyboard. So do we have a virtual keyboard in Composer? Yes, we do. Um, actually, it automatically pops up when you are using a text input, like Jeff is showing at the moment, or when you are using a web browser and you have some forms in the web page. Um, can I use that keyboard to search in a carousel? Uh, this is more uh, advanced um, building, I would say, or construction. But basically, I would use an Excel file as a data source to um, populate my carousel. Then the keyboard would be used to call the filter action that we have on Excel. And uh, yes, we are going to cover that in another webinar. Uh, we plan to do the first one, this first advanced webinar beginning of March. Um, we will show how to use Excel as a data feed, how to use the filters, um, how to use uh, the analytics to say, for example, I have a list of products, I want to know how, much, how many times this specific product was seen, was clicked uh, by your user. And a new question, what web browser are you using, i.e. Chrome OS? If I see a built-in web browser which is based on Chromium, so that's nearly Chrome embedded, for the player for Windows. And for player for iPad and Android, this is the native browsers of those platforms. I think we're okay with the questions, Jeff. Okay, thanks. If I recall correctly, for pr free and pro, with analytics, you get the last 24 hours worth of data. With uh, Composer Enterprise, you get a year's worth of data. I think that's the difference, mainly. Thanks. Uh, you could hear from, Vin from Sebastian's uh, discussions that uh, with a little understanding of how to work with uh, interface assets, with Excel, I mean, it's, you, can s you can really expand what's possible. That's why in a way, you're almost building an application. I mean, we don't really call it that. We call it an experience, but you'd be amazed at what you can construct. All right, you're very proud of yourself. You built this amazing experience. You want to shout it from the rooftops, right? You want to share it with your colleagues. Maybe you want to deploy it. So how do you do that? I mean, you could save it locally. You could just save it local. It's a bunch of flat files. You could zip it up, walk to another machine, put it on that machine, run it in player. You could do that. Uh, or to give it to a colleague, you could. But there's a much easier, more streamlined uh, approach to doing so. The prerequisite, you have to publish it. Get it into the cloud. Once it's in the cloud, now you can automate sharing, automate deployment, which we'll touch on. Publishing happens from within Composer. Under the file menu, here's publish. We can publish to your Amazon S3, Box, Dropbox, and FTP uh, accounts. It's not ours. We don't host it. It's your account and you publish it to that account, and that makes it available for sharing and for deployment. Okay. Once it's published, you can share it. Now, there's a tool called Management Console. It's a web-based tool. You don't pay a license for it. Everybody has access to it. One of the functions of Management Console is to list all of your published experiences. It's in a row. In a row is all the experiences you've ever published. doesn't matter where you published it to. If you publish, you'll see it. And selecting an experience in that list enables you to share it. In this example, look at the bottom of the image. See share with, email address is separated by. You select an experience. You enter all the email addresses of people you want to share it with. You click share, and there you go. You've shared it. It will show up in the experiences panel for player and composer. Under the file menu in composer, I can open up the experiences panel. This is what you see when you first run Composer or Player. Here's all of the experiences that have been shared with me. If somebody shares an experience with me, 
this is where you'll see it. If they already have an account in a two-face account, it just works. If they don't, they get an email that says, hey, somebody shared a pretty cool thing with you. You might want to create an account. But that's how sharing works. You publish it. Then in Management Console, you select that experience. You enter the email addresses, and off it goes. With the free and pro edition of Composer, you can share as read-only, so people can download a copy and modify that copy. If you want to collaborate on the master, so your colleagues don't have a copy, they're modifying the master, then the Enterprise Edition of Composer allows you to share with right privileges. So there you go. There's another example of uh, a Composer Enterprise feature, which is the ability to share with right privileges. Which reminds me, by the way, if you want to create your own custom interface asset, that's also uh, a Composer Enterprise capability. In general, it's an enterprise feature if it allows you to customize something out of the box. Custom design accelerator, custom interface asset, the ability to customize the master, all of those are, are enterprise capabilities. So if you have the free edition, the pro edition, you can share it, but you're sharing a copy. With the enterprise edition, you can share with write privileges or share with play only. They can't edit it at all. So you can do both. Lastly, because I published it, I can deploy it. So again, this is an image of Management Console. There's my experiences across the top. On the bottom are all of the devices running Player associated with my account. Could be Windows, iOS, Android, doesn't matter. All of the devices running Player associated with my account are listed on the bottom. I can tag them. These are in Chicago. This is in the office. This is in Boston. Filter based on those tags. And then just using my mouse, drag from the top, drag an experience onto a filtered list of, of players, and it automatically deploys. A thousand devices, one drag and drop. And it's running on a thousand devices. You can update player remotely, you can update the experience remotely, and it's an incremental upload. So every time you redeploy, it only copies the changes. You have one device at a trade show, probably not interesting. 100 devices in 100 cities, crazy important, because the alternative is to walk from device to device. Here, drag and drop, done. That's deployment. Uh, and this is also where you get your analytics data. You can see the button analytics at the bottom. So for each device, you can get analytics for an individual device or across all devices. We've covered everything. I, I, I have to believe, I hope it seemed easier than you may have anticipated and that you probably feel already a little empowered to do some pretty cool stuff. Certainly we didn't discuss everything in detail. Uh, analytics, we touched on it, but it's very powerful uh, and, and very important for signage. I mean, if you're building a, an interactive sign, you actually will know what works, right? The problem with a passive sign is you have no idea what, whether it works or not. You have to infer it through black magic. With an interactive sign, Collect analytics. You know exactly what interested people. Player for iPad and Android. We touched on it, but it's a whole other world in terms of uh, building it and deploying it. And the rules are pretty much the same, but uh, it's pretty impressive when you think about it that you can build for multiple platforms, building just from Composer. Content. We talked about importing Photoshop to generate images on the fly, uh, PDFs, PowerPoint, Excel. Uh, the video asset supports live streaming video using pretty much any internet-based pro video streaming protocol in the market. So you don't even have to be stuck with static video. It could work with real-time video. The remote control. Uh, one of the cool things about uh, Tuaface is we make available in Google Play, and the App Store, and the Windows Store, a remote control that allows you to use a tablet to drive your experience. So let's say you are running a session at a conference, and this is large overhead which isn't interactive anyway, let alone you'd need a ladder to reach the top, right? You could still use Intuaface, because what you can do is drive that large display with your Windows PC, but walk around the room with your iPad. And you can see mirrored on your iPad the running experience. You touch the iPad screen, everybody sees the results in the big display. Pretty cool. And the remote control is free. It's called the Intuapad. Go, go look for it. It's free in Google Play, the App Store, and the Windows Store. Scheduling, another thing we just touched on. Uh, every day at 3 o'clock, do this. Every day at 4 o'clock, do that. Every day at 5 o'clock, do this. You can any time, any day, any year. L again, like a, like a signage environment, we expect that kind of scheduling. You can do some pretty impressive things. 
And then remote actions. You know, we talked about triggers and actions. If this happens, then do that. Well, here's something pretty magical. The that could be in a different experience. It doesn't have to be in the same experience. It could be in a different one. So just like I can use interface assets to communicate with a third-party device, I can use actions to tell an experience to do something or a third-party device. If I push a button in experience A, I could cause the video to play in experience B, running on a different PC, maybe in a different country, if that makes any sense. Is it meaningful? So we haven't talked about how to do that, of course, but just be aware that you can. The interaction over here causes things to happen over there. We've covered a ton of ground, and although I'd like to think I've excited you, I hope you think that a composer looks kind of fun to use and that you're inspired. Of course, there's still a lot to learn. I mean, I don't think Intuaface is hard to learn. There's just a lot. So you still need to spend time. On our website, under the Learn menu, if you click Teach Yourself, there's a list of things you can do for self-education. Probably the most important thing you've done is watch this webinar. So you get to listen to somebody who understands the product to show you how to use this. I, I think you probably, that was the smartest thing you could do. The next thing probably would be the tutorial because it forces you to use the product step by step. You get your hands dirty and that's ultimately the best way. There are instructional videos. You get to hear me again. This time you watch me do things in a little more detail. Online documentation, over 200 articles and about every topic you can think of. Everything we discussed is documented in the online library. With a great search function, by the way. So if you have any questions, you want to do anything, try the library first. Webinar we've done. Discussion forums. Ask a question. Search previously asked questions to find out the answer. This is where you go. If you have a very deep question you can't find in the knowledge base, you're a little stuck, or you're just wondering, and you'll love these guys. They're very smart, and they get back to you right away. And then finally, we've pre-built a lot of experiences, so you can see what's possible. If I return to Composer and open the Experiences panel, there's a Samples tab. You'll see the Samples tab when you run Composer or Player. These are pre-built experiences that we have created that you can download for free, not just to play, but to open in edit mode and see how we built it. Uh, there's a, a digital sign that uh, gives you uh, local attractions based on the weather. Here's a photo booth using the camera on your PC. Uh, here's a photo exhibition formatted for uh, the Samsung Galaxy. You can run it anywhere, but it's formatted for the Galaxy tab. Here's a live real estate property search using a UK-based uh, real estate search web service. Grocery uh, uh, promotion, garment customization, build your own burger. I mean, some pretty interesting stuff built using features you, you've now been introduced to. So download them, open them, play them, see how we edited them, see how we built them. Sebastian, any questions? Um, so do we have a plan to make a macOS compatible version in the future? So I guess you're talking about Composer. Uh, we certainly have plans, but not in the coming future, I would say in the coming weeks or months. Uh, Although you can run Composer using uh, softwares like Parallels or Bootcamp, we have lots of our users who are doing that actually, and it runs pretty well uh, if you have a good Mac. Um, what does Composer export at the end? So maybe now with the sharing it's more uh, clear. Uh, it basically saves your experience as an IFX file, interface experience file, which is XML behind or JSON, uh, and then the interface player is going to read this file and play the experience. So what you are going to send between composer and player is this IFX file and all the content that you are embedding in your experience. Something you'll never see unless you want to. I mean, you never ever have to play with an IFX file. It's all under the covers. Correct. Um, can we monitor our different players in the park? Yes, you can. Using the management console, you can see all the players which are running. You can see a snapshot of the screen. You can see the version of your player, the version, the name of the experience which is running, the license information. So this is what we have for the moment. And no, we don't have yet the IP address, the location, the battery for iPad, or the internet speed yet. But this is very good idea. So I will push that to our product team 
Uh, so this is something that would be very useful for um, version 2 of the monitoring. What are the, the 3D models types we are going to support in the February release? Uh, all the major ones, I don't have the full list uh, yet, but it will be written in the documentation page that I mentioned in the chat. Basically, 3DS, DAE, OBJ, DXF, all the standard ones. And the minimal requirements to play a composer on the player, I put the link um, in the in the chat room. But basically, any Windows 7 or Windows 8 computer, even embedded versions of Windows, are working perfectly with interface. Yeah. That's it for the questions. I, I certainly hope I have dispelled any concerns about the ease of use or what's possible. I hope you found it to be easy enough that you want to use it right away. <laughs> I certainly tell people just give it a day and you're already creating something that will liven up a sales pitch or a trade show or an information kiosk or whatever. Um, Seb and I will hang on for a little bit longer so if anybody has questions after we stop the recording we'll continue to answer them. Uh, but before we stop it, thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for skipping the Windows 10 announcement <laughs> to join us for this particular webinar. And um, uh, happy experience creating. I think you're going to have a lot of fun. Thanks so much, guys.